called me a shit house coon or something like that. Black cunt, black monkey. As I jumped up, I heard like, woo, woo, woo. Racism is something that permeates every single level of, of English football. Little black cunt, why is a black lad playing in goal? Curry smelling twat, smash that packy. I heard black cunt. The warning has already been given that if the racist abuse continued, the game would be stopped. Fuck you, boys, you cunt! The FA have said a number of England players, including Raheem Sterling, Danny Rose and Callum Hudson-Odoi, were subject to abhorrent racist chanting. It's happening again and again and again, and nothing's changing. All you're doing is living your dream and and then um, qualifying for the final of the FA Cup. Michael Oliver blows his whistle. The Watford players celebrate because Watford are in their first cup final since 1984. After the Wolverhampton game in the semi-final where we got a barrage of abuse and um, I had to literally take off comments because it was non-stop. People want to get bitter and think of ways to offend you and, and to get in your head, and for some reason or not, that's the way they wanted to go by. For us to win a massive game and, and to be racially abused off the Wolves fans it took a bit of the edge off the victory. You're getting called everything under the sun. Just things that you, you, you don't expect to see. Nothing got done about it. The police didn't do nothing, and the FA or people higher up didn't pay any attention to it. It's not the best place to be in. I think that was a big eye-opener for everyone of how direct and, and personal the abuse got. We've got so, probably the most multicultural squad in the league and, and we, we took a stance together, which, which was the main thing. know that we are looking to deal with racist abuse, hate crime and any sort of homophobic chanting. So if we can encourage fans, spectators, members of the public to report these things straight away to control, we are in a better position to go and deal with these instances, get witnesses, statements and ideally video and sound, that's the big one we will be far more successful than trying to deal with it three days, four days, five days later. We've always been dealing with incidents of this nature for as long as I can remember. You know, and I've been involved with this football club well over 30 years. It's not something you ignore, you deal with it. Before the penalty, the fans were giving me a bit of stick. Just normal names that you hear within football. I thought, well, when I score, I'll give some back to you as you don't want to give it to me. I'd cut my ear to them as in to say, yeah, look, there you go. And then, and then that's when obviously all the racist abuse started happening. They were just calling me a black cunt, black monkey. And obviously they were doing the monkey signs towards me as well, as, a, as I'm looking at them. After that happened, as soon as I got the ball, all about three and a half thousand fans just booing me every single second. 
The first time it happened, it went straight through me. And like, like just tingles went down my spine. And I lost the ball. I think I gave it like it was like a goal kick. I ended up giving away when I could have held it in the corner. I feel like I'm getting booed because I'm black now. Like I just got racially abused on the side, and because we reacted to it, now I'm getting booed. The ref was saying that I sparked it all off. If I didn't do that celebration, then none of this would be happening. Which, as a ref, you shouldn't really be saying because that just says that. So because I've done a, a celebration towards them, that I should now receive racial abuse. I felt like I was in a different country, like I wasn't even in England, and it was a crazy thing to feel. Spurs were fighting for promotion into the top tier, and I was playing a pretty big role in that, um, as I, I was playing every game at centre-back. <laughs> We had a corner. As I jumped up, I heard like <laughs> um, in my ear, um, and I just couldn't believe it because obviously we've we've never heard of an incident like that on the pitch um, in women's football. I think the moment where it really sank in was when I went into the changing room and I was telling my teammates, "I can't believe what just happened." Um, the number eight just made monkey noises in my ear as I just as I just went to head the ball. And I think at that point, that's when I started to feel anger and frustration and, and I re just really couldn't believe what had just happened. And yeah, I sort of um, got a bit animated and upset in, at half time. So I decided to put a tweet out and little did I know it, it absolutely blew up and I can't believe the reaction that it got. There was this one, which was, um, that was a gif of a, of a monkey clapping. Um, and then we've got this one, which was a, it's obviously a pregnant black woman and the doctor's pointing at the screen and it's a, a baby monkey. Now with social media, that can generate around the world within, within a few minutes. It takes someone five or 10 seconds to, to write something behind a keyboard or to, or to blurt something out. Um, but for me personally, that's affected me for 10 months now and, and, and it's still ongoing. What's happening now? The referee's blown his whistle and is running towards this side of the field again. Racism has overshadowed a football match between England and Bulgaria in Sofia. The referee stopped the game twice in the first half after Bulgarian fans directed racist chants and Tyrone Mings. We made a collective decision to continue the game. But the protocols had been followed, um, and if it happened again, we would have then perhaps moved on to the next step and come off the pitch. People say players shouldn't walk off the pitch. To me, that is just standing there and accepting it. The only person that really is going to protect you and fully look after you is yourself, really. If you call us a nigger, a black cunt, monkey, whatever it is, on the field and we hear it, you know that will most likely affect our performance. It's, it's how you deal with it personally. I mean, no one really has the right to tell you how to react, being racially abused. I was ready to go, we was all excited. We didn't want to lose, that was the main thing. We wanted to get something out of the game. In the first half, the game passed with any incident. Second half, there was an incident in the penalty area. The referee saw fit to give him a penalty. And then the hatred started. They was checking the gate. Like, uh, if they catch me, they're going to, to do something very, very uh, bad to me. My goalkeeper went to the side of the goal and he was spat at on his head. And then he was spat at again on his jersey. It's my job. And uh, to do my job, and people insulting me, treating me differently, and spit on me, it's not fair. Now, for me, the game should have been abandoned then. You can't ask the goalkeeper to turn his back on these fans step back on his line and attempt to save a penalty. I'd picked up the ball and I was walking away 
and then someone shouted. And that's when I kicked off and was getting kind of angry and was being restrained. I walked him off the pitch, told him to go in the dressing room and not move until I come back. And my captain stopped him in the tracks and he said to me, please don't send us back out there. We don't want to go out there. I said, 100%. Haringey Borough and Yeovil Town's FA Cup fourth qualifying round match was abandoned today after reports of racial abuse. The game was halted in the 64th minute. The people who go and watch football and play football are not separate from society, they're a part of society. However, football has always provided the outlet. It provides, it provides a platform for vast outpourings of emotion, a platform for exhibitionism, for showing emotions in a public space. One of, what makes the Premier League one of the best leagues and football one of the best sports is that it's all about passion, right? So the marketing team are selling passion. So they're building it, building it, building up for a week two weeks, and then when it comes to the game, people are wound up. Judgment call doesn't go their way, the ref makes a bad decision, the player goes down, and then you're not expecting everyone to jump, cool, but someone will. Fucking shit! Absolutely fucking disgrace! Fucking twat! Football matches and football stadiums are probably the most passionate and um, environment, and maybe aggressive at times environment you'll be in, but Racism can't be your go-to way to, to let off some steam, you know, it's, it's unacceptable. I'm not too sure how they're coming across and how they're singing it. Whereas if they are singing it because they know it's racist or they're singing it because they're oblivious to the situation and just singing it because it's a funny song or however they see it. I think they want you to believe that it's a compliment, but when you know the true history of why it's like that and what happened and where that stereotype came from, you realize that it's really not something good to celebrate or to bring up. The abuse that players get, people just expect these human beings to act like robots and, and pretend that nothing is wrong and that everything is fine. You try and not let it get to you, but deep down it will, especially after the game. It, it will get to you after the game and it's, 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 it's just it's very, very hard. I'm 29 now. Um, and I've pretty much had it most weekends. I had one at a game where, just before the game started, I touched my bar and then he just laughed at me and said, hi, oh, look at you, you monkey. So look, imagine thinking, right, make sure you start right, make sure your kicking's right, make sure you're switched on. And then that gets said to me before the game's even started. They're an animal, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an animal. I don't think you can understand it unless it's happened to you. I kind of just say I'm fine and I get on with it and I crack on and then you're kind of just pushing the emotions to the side really, which you shouldn't be doing because it's a, it's a serious topic and it, it drains you a lot mentally. You kind of don't really know how to react. You're, you're just kind of, you feel stuck. That's the best way to explain it, you feel stuck. I managed to play in the Premier League, played a lot of games in the Championship. And I played in League One and League Two. Played for England at under 20 and under 21 level. Played for Team GB in the Olympics. For me, one of the biggest contributing factors to me retiring at 28 was due to the amount of racism that exists in the game. Even up until now, I've probably really been struggling 
feeling a bit sort of isolated. My mum sort of raised me as a single parent since I was about five years old, so it's always been me and her. But I think this time, she really struggled because there was nothing really that she could do. There were times I went home from training and I'd just be crying on the way home and, you know, I didn't really leave my house. There was a week, I don't think. I think I, my mum managed to drag me out at one point just to go to Tesco. I was in a dark place. I was, I was very, 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 very low. I... Uh, become distant. I didn't really want to see anyone, didn't want to talk to anyone. And it got to the point where I got a low and I said to myself, I need to get out of this. I need to, it's not, this is not me. So I, I started seeing a counsellor and that's, it was very hard. No one, this is the first time I've, I've actually said it. Only one person knows. And that's the actual counsellor herself. Uh, it was hard, very, very hard. Mo Salah was taking corner at the time, um, and someone in the back, a West Ham fan, uh, started heckling. At this point, I, I started recording. I was just so shocked by the things that were coming out of his mouth. And more so, I was shocked that no one really was reacting in any way whatsoever. There were about 20 stewards in front of us um, and all the West Ham fans, and it was almost like it's normal. I hadn't really encountered something like this at a football match. And actually, when I posted this video on, on Twitter, I got a lot of abuse from the West Ham fans for putting this out there, which is quite bizarre because, you know, racism is, isn't, isn't just a bad thing, it's, it's an actual criminal offence. It's almost terrifying, actually, to, to, have, to have this kind of abuse being shouted at um, so openly, so casually. This is really quite dis disgusting, shocking stuff. We're talking about death camps. We're talking about the death of, of people in the Holocaust. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking literally about the, the machinations of that, the gassing of people. I think when you have people in senior positions that are leading the country who openly, like very openly, have racist views, It makes it a lot easier for people to be open with their racist views. It is a scary place to be, um, but a lot of this is British society in general. You know, the country feels at the moment like a, a very, very fractured place, um, a very angry place, uh, and football feels very fractured and very angry, more so than I think I've ever felt it. Brexit at the moment, it's, um, that, that's huge, man, and, and it's, it's, it's like it's given society, given society and communities the opportunity to call people names, the opportunity to to differentiate between communities. You fear for your, for your children when they leave, this, leave for school in the morning. Um, but having to walk onto a football pitch and fear that your players are going to be racially abused, that's not on. semi-final we came to the point where I had to take my players off the football pitch because the players the players 
felt that the whole evening was a mess because of the officials, that there was a genuine bias towards the opposing team based on the fact that we had black players, Asian footballers on our team. Since then, it's been nothing but grief. Rao, Rao, be alert. Hey, Jay, lucky. We're seen as probably the biggest Asian football club here in the UK. Gone are the days where you're physically abused or you're verbally abused by being called a paki twat or a paki cunt. It's now a different type of racism that we're facing in this day and age. Aki Hamza, I second ball, boys. Come on, we're not sharp enough. The whole structure, the whole setup of the football pyramid at the moment is not inducive to supporting clubs like ours. Come out, come out. I, for one, will never, ever report an incident of racism or discrimination again. I won't bother. It's not going to change. You can't have someone making a decision on an incident of racism that's happened during grassroots football if you're a white middle-class person. You don't know what it's like to be called a paki twat. You don't know what it's like to be called um, a monkey. You don't know what it's like to be told, go home, go back to where you've come from. So don't tell me I understand what you're going through because you don't. And until you get people who, who've been through it or people who can understand what we're going through, nothing is going to change. Hey, just push up, Jerry. Stay, 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 Jerry. Just go, go, go. Danny Rose now is pushed on from Maguire on this near side, the left. He goes back. We're all in this together as players. All the players are just there to earn a living, to live their dream, to be successful. The footballing authorities, FIFA, the FA, UEFA, they just need to do better for players, really. How many nationalities, skin colours are absolute mega stars in this league to think that they still get racially abused because without these players, the Premier League would be not even half the league it is. Racism is, is football's dirty little secret and the big brands that are football clubs would rather it went away. The incentive for clubs is to engage with these issues on essentially a superficial PR level. It would be tackled in a better way if we see those clubs literally just take the reins off and the sponsors take the reins off and just say, you know what, go for it, talk about it, we trust you. I think only then can we feel like we could really give this a proper fight.